Okay, so this really is the surface of Mars. Uh, some of our first images uh, from the Mars uh, mass cam cameras. We don't actually send robots just because it's fun. <laughs> they have science goals. And this mission is very exciting for me uh, because its primary science goal uh, for the rover was to uh, trace the environment. What was the environment of a place on Mars like? And could it have hosted life as we know it from Earth? And so as a scientist, we're looking for something um, that we don't know if it exists, if we're looking for life, but we can use all of our skills as sedimentologists and geochemists to understand whether or not an environment could have supported life. And we're assuming that means you had liquid water, a uh, source of energy, and uh, carbon compounds. And so the, this mission really is designed to look at ancient <coughs> environments uh, to evaluate their uh, biological potential. And the surface radiation is important. I mentioned it for a future human exploration of organic compounds. Meteorites have delivered organic compounds to the surface of Mars, so there should be organics on Mars, but we don't know what would have happened to them, even if there wasn't any life. Um, so it's a very interesting question uh, to try to understand organic geochemistry on a planet that's not dominated by life. Into four places on the entire planet of Mars, and a lot of them have looked similar because the engineers require you to land somewhere that's safe and flat, if you crash, you get no science, as we've also discovered with various missions. And so um, we geologists, of course, like to look at cliffs, um, which is incompatible with safe landing. Um, but this time, uh, we chose a place, Gale Crater, uh, that has a flat area, uh, which is this ellipse here, uh, and then layered rocks at the base of this mountain, Mount Sharp, or Aeolus Mons, uh, within the crater. And uh, this was the first mission where the geologists got to choose among four sites. The previous missions uh, for rovers, the landing site was all chosen by the engineers for safety. Um, but we had a very reliable landing system. You should watch the video, Seven Minutes of Terror, online. It looks really scary, but we actually have a really good landing system. And um, we, we actually landed in the ellipse right about here, and the rover is designed to be able to drive the eight kilometers or five miles to the, to the base of Mount Sharp here. We haven't done that yet. We've been on the ground for 10 months. <laughs> we haven't even quite started driving there um, because geologists like road stops and looking at rocks. <laughs> there are always unplanned stops on any good field trip. Um, so Mount Sharp is down here. This is where we landed. There's a valley, which we've named Peace Ballast, uh, that feeds into an alluvial fan. And we knew this existed when we landed. Um, and um, we landed quite a ways from it. Um, but it turns out we found some really interesting things right where we landed. Um, these are our first images. This is Mount Sharp. It's actually four and a half kilometers high. And the base is, uh, as I said, about eight kilometers away. We landed on this gravel plane, but it turns out that our rockets uh, from the landing system scoured out some of this gravel. Some of that gravel en ended up on top of the rover deck, uh, which was unfortunate. But it also gave us our first exposure of outcrop. And so uh, this is not a particularly outstanding looking outcrop. Um, and it looks sort of grungy, but it is pebbles embedded in, in uh, something harder. Now, when we first landed, because this had been influenced by the uh, rocket plumes, we weren't 100% sure whether this was some sort of dura crust, something that maybe the rockets influenced, uh, but it was certainly uh, intriguing to look at. Um, so in deciding, we had, we had weeks of engineering checkouts to do. And um, we have these orbiters around Mars that give us data to look at. So this is Curiosity at its landing site right there. This dark area is the area where we disrupted the dust around it. And when we looked at this image, we saw a layered bedrock over here. 
And one of the things that, that I helped coordinate before landing was making a geologic map. This is the first time we've had orbital data uh, sufficiently high quality that could do a lot of, of mapping beforehand. And so we had traced this alluvial fan, um, shown here in oranges, and the textures of the rocks changes, change as you come down here. Um, but my, our interpretation on landing was that these bedded rocks that are just east of where we were are related to this alluvial fan. We actually landed on what we just called a hummocky surface, which is that gravelly, that gravelly plain. So given that our mission was to look at ancient environments that might have been habitable, uh, we have evidence of water, water runs downhill, that might be a good place to maybe drive half a kilometer out of the way uh, to look at the rocks. And so when you take the, the large scale map and put it on here, you can see the boundary between the hummocky surface and the alluvial fan. And so as a team, we decided that instead of going to Mount Sharp, where we have hundreds of meters of great exposure, we would drive half a kilometer uh, to the side. And when we started doing that, we actually uh, found two outcrops that I'm going to show you pictures of that were similar to uh, the rocks that, I sh that we saw on landing. So we have to name things because you can't really say, oh, uh, you know that rock we saw, was it three or four days ago, the one that was sort of pancake shaped? That, that doesn't work so well. So what we're doing is we named, when we did the mapping, we divided it up into quadrants and we named each one of those. And, and the one we landed in is Yellowknife Bay, um, named for, um, well, it's Yellowknife, na named for Yellowknife Canada. And so we're naming the rocks after uh, Precambrian formations in northern Canada. When we go to another um, uh, section, we'll, we'll switch areas. But we saw these two outcrops. Again, uh, not something that you'd normally take your said strat class on a field trip to go see. So this one's on Mars. Uh, this one's in the Atacama Desert in Chile. They have rounded pebbles. Uh, sort of millimeter to centimeter size. Uh, the sorting is good. When we actually did the statistics, um, they are well rounded and, um, and well sorted and very, very consistent with pebbles in an alluvial fan in a stream deposit. And um, as one of my colleagues said, and here's, here's another outcrop of those, again, with rounded pebbles, um, some larger ones, a little bit of imbrication and uh, some lineations in these. His colleague said, location, location, location. You wouldn't get this in science uh, if it was on Earth. You wouldn't even take your students necessarily to see uh, rounded pebbles. Uh, but when we actually go through the calculations of flow speeds and uh, the transport distance required to get the rounding, these pebbles would have had to been transported uh, many kilometers, possibly about 10 kilometers in flow depths of 30 to 50 centimeters and flow speeds of a, a half a meter a second. So it's, this is pretty vigorous flow over long distances. So, so our conclusion from these rocks is that we had, had to have persistent water flow um, on Mars. And so one of the controversies is now Mars is very dry. We've seen valleys and river networks but some people have, have uh, proposed and calculated ways that those could form through very short-lived water flow. So for example, if you had an impact into ground ice, you could maybe create a transient atmosphere that lasted a few tens of years, hundreds of years, something like that, and maybe produce these features. The, the rounding of the pebbles um, and their size requires more persistent flow, which, which is actually good if you're thinking about an environment that might have been uh, uh, able to support life. So we saw those rocks um, just in this area here, and we have some images uh, from the sides that suggest there are a few more. Um, but these aren't, from the map, directly associated with the alluvial fan, although they are. <laughs> uh, they are alluvial fan faces. And so we kept going uh, towards uh, the mapped alluvial fan. As, as we got closer, um, we started using the mass cam images um, combined with the orbital images to, to make some more detailed maps. And one of the things that we, we could see in both of them is this very prominent um, uh, scarp. It's only about half a meter high or so, but it's, it's regional. 
And often when you get a topographic break like that, you have more resistant rocks overlying uh, more uh, uh, softer rocks. So this is down, uh, further down, uh, from, from down in here, uh, looking, one looking back this way and one looking the other direction. And what you see is uh, what we named the Gillespie unit here. Uh, it's actually sandstone. When we put the Molly camera up, you can see that it's got coarse sand grains. And then we have what we're calling the, the sheep bed unit, uh, which is more recessive. And then there's some sort of uh, dike running through here. So we started um, characterizing it, and this is uh, from the camera on the ChemCam, looking through the optics. And so it's a, a microscopic imager at a, at a distance, and you have all of these white veins. And using the laser, it's actually kind of hard to hit the veins, but if you do enough transects across them, the laser leaves a little pit so you can see where you analyze. And when you actually hit some of these veins, you see signatures of calcium and sulfur and hydrogen. And uh, if you compare them, of course, to rocks on Earth, uh, that's very consistent with uh, gypsum and hydrate or bassanite, all calcium sulfates with um, some hydrogen in and hydrate doesn't have the hydrogen. Um, so it looked like what we had is the, the using both ChemCam and the alpha ray particle spectrometers, we have a rock that basically has a basaltic composition, something that's more or less the elemental composition of an igneous rock with these uh, sulfates coming through them. And as um, anyone who studies some geology knows, the sulfate minerals are typically uh, formed uh, from water, and um, there are salt minerals um, they form. So the mass cameras also have filters, and um, they're color images, but we have the scientific filters. And when we take the pictures, there's uh, a change in wavelength Some at these higher wavelengths is often correlated with hydration in sulfate minerals. It can't tell you uh, the cation in those minerals, uh, but what you can do is you can map out a whole image area. So, uh, for example, here's one set of images with a lot of these blubs and veins in them, and you can map out the extent of the uh, hydration signature, and a lot of these uh, are these hydrated uh, signatures. And so, basically, with the, the chem cam, you get single point analyses, and then with the mass cam, you can extend those over a larger area. It's one of the great ways that our instruments work together. As I mentioned, the APXS instrument requires uh, putting the instrument on the ground that gives uh, much more precise elemental compositions than the chem cam does. And so, um, we've normalized the composition to uh, the soil, and when you put the APXS down on these uh, rocks, um, they have a, sort of an average composition. When they're based with these veins in them, you see higher sulfur and uh, calcium. Um, Mars is red and dusty, and so we have a wire brush to clean off the rocks, and uh, we did that, and one of the most exciting things in the whole mission was seeing that this is gray and not red. And, and Mars is a red planet from iron oxides, and iron oxides don't uh, persist. Uh, organic compounds react with iron oxides. And so if you are looking for oil or organics, um, you often look for the reducing shales. And so this is uh, the, the MER rovers both had a rock abrasion tool uh, that was uh, sort of more vigorous than our brushes. And everything they brushed that wasn't a pristine volcanic rock was red on the inside. And so this, is the, this was the first clue that we might have had a, a rock, sedimentary rock that formed in a reducing environment. The other thing that's really cool is there's scratches in the rock, which suggests it is pretty um, soft. And we couldn't, with the Molly imager, we couldn't actually see any grains. So it's finer than fine sand, soft, and uh, does not have uh, oxidized iron in it. So basically, if you're thinking about looking for organic compounds, this is the sort of place 
that you go look for. So that gets us to the drill. So this is, we have, you know, we have a cat on the rubber, but there's also a twin at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And this is the twin. I happened to have been there when they were uh, preloading the drill. So this is a rotary percussion drill, and it's um, basically the idea of something you would get at Home Depot for a construction project. Um, and, you know, you push on the drill, and you make a hole, and it makes powder, it all seems fine. When you're doing it on Mars, it's a little harder. This is on the end of a couple meter long arm. And so the way the engineers worked out doing this is to preload pressure on these two um, posts. And then the drill, um, that pressure is transferred to the drill bit when they go into the rock. And the powder just comes out around the drill bit, and we have to get it into our instruments inside the rover. So the, the way the engineers work that out is the, the powder piles up, and then some of it, when it piles up about a centimeter deep, some of it gets into the sleeve, and then there's a screw that uh, turns and pulls the powder up into this chamber on the top of the drill. Then all that powder has to go from this chamber out through a little hole, and it has to be sieved because the chem and x-ray diffraction can only take particles that are less than uh, 150 microns in diameter. And so the rover, the arm has to do all this sort of shaking and gyrations uh, to, to get the powder through. And actually, it, it uh, took us a little while to do that, um, but we managed to. And so here's a picture of our real drill bit with the chem cam, our test hole, and our real hole, and our powder that came out at the other end. Now, you'll notice that there's some red here. Um, before we drilled the sample, we scooped uh, some of the, uh, some windblown sediment that was just at the surface. And uh, we did that as our first uh, analysis. And um, not only do you have to process the sample, but you can't actually clean the equipment. And so there's a certain amount of contamination from one sample to the next. And you can see that here, the surface being red, and then this is our, our, uh, our powder that, that we drilled. So we got a little bit of, of the powder in here. Um, we drilled the second sample in part to reduce the level of contamination. And these are the results from Kenman. So uh, x-ray diffraction, you shine x-rays onto your powder sample, and the minerals uh, uh, reflect those x-rays at different angles, depending on the crystal structure. And so um, this particular instrument, this big green band, uh, represents the uh, windows uh, into the instrument. Uh, but this one, the rock nest sand shadow, is our scooped windblown sediment. And most of these bands represent uh, typical basaltic minerals like um, plagioclase, olivine, uh, pyroxene. A uh, very small amount of anhydrite, and then quite a few uh, iron oxides. Uh, a bunch of the uh, that sem that sample, I think about 30% was amorphous, um, uh, which could be glasses or nanophase particles. Our drill powder um, had those a lot of those same. Uh, igneous minerals, but really importantly, it had uh, minerals that uh, have a low scattering angle uh, that are clay minerals. And actually, uh, somewhere around a quarter of the sample is composed of, of uh, smack type clay minerals. And uh, those really require uh, long term uh, water rock uh, interactions uh, to form those clays. And then there are also uh, some. Uh, the calcium sulfate minerals is predicted in, um, in the veins, and then I said the igneous minerals. So basically, the composition of the rock is the same as an igneous rock. It's more or less bold, um, uh, basaltic, uh, but the mineralogy shows evidence of, of extensive alteration to clay minerals uh, with water. So when we put this into SAM with our mass spectrometers, um, there are a lot of different experiments um, that you can do. And so uh, uh, the first one that we do is basically heat the sample up and look at the gases that come off. And um, quite a bit of water comes off, and the water coming off at this temperature is consistent with the release of structural water in the smectite clays that the uh, chemin instruments saw. 
Um, there's also a release of carbon dioxide. And uh, this carbon dioxide could either come from organics or carbonate minerals. Um, when we sent uh, part of this gas to the gas chromatograph uh, mass spectrometer, we didn't detect organic car carbon. Uh, but with this process of releasing and these temperatures of release, it's possible that there, there are some uh, structurally stable organic compounds, such as those that come from meteorites, that might not have gotten into the gas chromatograph. And so we're not uh, sure what the, the phase of this carbon um, is yet. The oxygen release in this particular case is also it's not clear where that came from either. So the scoop sample had um, some chlorates and perchlorates, which are very oxidizing, and they would uh, produce this oxygen. And we have some cross-contamination of the sample. And so it's possible that this is from cross-contamination, or it could be something that's indigenous uh, to the drill sample. There's still a lot of work going on and in interpreting uh, a lot of this data. Um, we also have two forms of sulfur. So we have a sulfate peak and a sulfide peak. And um, our, our work on this uh, today, we don't know specifically what minerals the sulfate and sulfide are coming from. Uh, but the team is quite convinced that we have both oxidized and reduced uh, sulfur uh, in this sample. And so we've done, we did a number of analysis on this uh, first drill sample, and in part to reproduce the results and to evaluate the effects of contamination, we drilled uh, a second sample in a nearby area. And this one has a few more concretions in the area here. We're looking for something that was quite similar but had uh, enough differences to uh, give us new information. And that analysis is ongoing now. We haven't uh, finished interpreting the results within the team and, and haven't, uh, and since we don't have them, we haven't released them to the, to the public either. Um, we're really working on that uh, right now. Um, this, this sample is uh, uh, sufficiently similar and different to the last one that there's a lot of good information from it. Uh, based on our first uh, drill analysis, um, we feel like we, in some sense, have already reached our mission success, in that we found a sample that reacted with water that was moderately low salinity and moderate pH. The clay minerals we see wouldn't form at an acidic pH, which is uh, where the, the uh, interpretation of other environments uh, was thought to be at low pH. And um, we're not seeing um, salts except for these calcium sulfates that are in the veins which uh, cross-cut the rock itself. Um, although there was some oxygen released, we think that based on the fact that we have uh, probably some sort of sulfide mineral, uh, it was mostly a reducing environment and, and we know that if there was chemical energies so that that could support life. And then uh, there's carbon. Again, we're not sure exactly uh, which phase it is in. But if you take these together, we def we found an environment that could definitely have supported microbial life as we know it on Earth. And in fact, John Grossinger at the press conference um, in a response to a question said, yeah, it's water that you could have drunk. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, it might have had a little too much sulfide in it for me, but you never know. <laughs> so basically, if you take this result um, with these mudstones, and, and here's our, our self-portrait with our two little the drill holes here. We have evidence of, of long-lived flowing water in a stream-type environment with rounded pebbles. And then we have evidence of standing water. Both the grain size of this rock is very small, and it has a high proportion of clay minerals. So we know we had to have persistent water to, uh, to alter the rock. And so, in some sense, we, these, these are incredibly important, yet simple findings. So these are the sorts of things that my students do in, this, in their sedimentology class in some of the first labs. And all of you who are geologists uh, you know that this is really sort of basic <coughs> observational geology. However, because it's on Mars, it has huge implications for the climate and history of Mars itself. And we think that these rocks are related to the alluvial fan, and we've basically gone from this spot to this spot right here. Gone almost nowhere. 
um, in terms of distance. And those who aren't, uh, maybe don't understand the subtleties of, of uh, uh, sedimentology are going, why in the world haven't you gone to all these beautiful rocks? Why aren't we climbing the mountain? So we've gone 500 meters and we've got eight kilometers to go until we get to this area. And uh, in a press release actually on uh, Wednesday, uh, they announced that we, we have a couple things we want to tie up uh, in this area we're calling Glen Elk. Um, basically, it's the same forward and back. So the idea was we have to go back <laughs> when we named the Glen Elk that. But basically, in the, in the space of a couple weeks, um, once we do these last few uh, analyses, we are going to start heading for the hills. And this is a stratigrapher's dream. <laughs> so um, this is looking at a canyon. There are giant uh, branches at the base of this deposit that's uh, probably fluvial. There's a fan here. There's 500 meters of section. Um, rocks with different weathering styles. Um, like there's this marker bed here that's clearly different from these. Based on signatures from orbit, there are clay minerals and sulfate minerals and, and iron oxides in this in varying proportions in the different layers. And this is really why we chose to go to Gale Crater. And if you look at the math cam images of it, so this, I'm going to show the, the last three images. One's looking here, one's looking here, and then an oblique view of the area right in here, um, sort of looking across here. It's just fantastic. And so we've got these layers with different features, crazy weathering rocks at the top. Um, and then our, our plan is to actually go over to this area. This is the canyon coming out with this fan. And um, uh, there's no scale, <laughs> no graduate students ascend to run over there for scale. But that little teeny spot right there is the size of our rover. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. So thank you. What was that? Surface temperature. Uh, surface temperature. It does get up to freezing in the sun in the summer, and I think it gets to about a minus, I think it's getting to about minus 100 Celsius at night. There's very little atmosphere, very little greenhouse effect, and so there are huge temperature swings. And so our, our rover is designed um, to be able to work in the cold, and so all the joints and things have heaters, um, but we are have to do some things we do have to do uh, only certain times of day when it's warm enough. Question was have we seen any effects from uh, dry ice carbon dioxide? Um, we're quite close to the equator and so uh, the CO2 ice does not tend to form there because um, we um, it's not condensing we're not quite cold enough for it to condense out at the concentrations uh, at the atmospheric pressures that we have. So the atmospheric pressure on Mars is about 140th of what it is on Earth. So it's very, very low pressure. Is, we have data for the atmosphere, and we have some data for the gases coming off the rocks. So unfortunately, the, we can't capture all of, for example, the water or all of the carbon dioxide. So we have. Um, the, the way the instrument has been run so far. And that's so that we can get a bunch of different information. So when you haven't captured all of the carbon dioxide, you don't know what your the isotopic shifts within the instrument are. So, so at this point, we have some good isotopic data on the atmosphere, um, noble gases, water, hydrogen, and carbon, um, but not on the rocks. So the other questions about the mudstones and the fractures the timing and the pressures are things that, as a team, we have been discussing and, and um, have not converged on an interpretation, except for one fact, which everyone knows, which is the mudstone's older than the fractures. <laughs> right? But, but in terms of, of how much overburden you need to form fractures like that, we don't know how strong the rock is, we don't know the pressures, we don't know the burial depths. 
we don't know all of those things that you want to know, and we're we're trying to work back to get them. We we have we have looked at them uh, with the microscopic imager, and we have not seen uh, layering in the white veins. There there are some other features that may be fracture fills that are dark that may have layering. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to do all the geology that you want to do with a rover and 450 team members. <laughs> so, um, there, there are international treaties that are related to the cleanliness of rovers and, so, uh, and, and missions. And so uh, it's very expensive to make something fully sterile, guaranteed sterile. And so um, we, the MSL mission is not 100% sterile, and that meant that we could not land in a place where there might be water ice in the ground. And, and that's because, in particular, since we have plutonium on board, if it crashed and it wasn't sterile, you could actually create an oasis for terrestrial life, bringing it with us. Um, so Gale Crater does not have, there's no evidence for ground ice. And, um, and so we didn't have to sterilize the rover to the point where we were worried about contaminating Mars. Um, all of the tools that are um, handling the sample um, and will put um, material into the SAM instrument, which can detect organics, were cleaned extra well. And so that sample processing system is particularly clean. And it's not as hard to make it sterile as it is to remove the organics. And, and it's actually incredibly difficult to get equipment clean enough so that none is detected in our instrument. And we have, actually, we have detected organic compounds, some of which we know we brought with us. And so it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of uh, trickiness uh, with that. If we, so if the Phoenix lander landed at a high uh, latitude where there was water ice, and it had to go through much more extensive sterilization uh, processes. Can you talk about the magnetic field of the planet and how it regulates the radiation belt? Yeah, so right now Mars does not have a magnetic field, and so the um, uh, extent of radiation at the surface, there are many more charged particles that reach the surface, and those are being uh, measured by the, uh, uh, the RAD instrument, radiation, and I don't remember what RAD stands for, but probably radiation detection. Um, and so, it, it, Mars is uh, it, uh, exposed to cosmic rays and solar flare uh, particles at a level that, that there isn't. And so one of the research questions is how those particles interact with the atmosphere in the absence of the magnetic field. And so um, we don't have uh, uh, strong results yet uh, from the ground, um, at least that, that I've heard exactly how it works, uh, like the, the interpretations. Um, but uh, there, uh, one of the main things for the RAD instrument is to understand how the absence of the magnetic field influences the radiation that you get in the ground. So Gale Crater is a very low place on Mars. So we're at, I think, I think it's about minus four kilometers below the equivalent of sea level, the average datum, um, and, and near the equator. And so it has a lower radiation than some of the higher areas, and you can really look at the effects of the atmosphere and secondary particles. Question in the back. Uh, did you ask if there are any mechanical problems? Um, no, there haven't been any at all. Um, when we landed, one of the wind sensors on REMS was damaged probably by gravel that was kicked up during landing. And we had um, a computer hang, um, and we rebooted onto another computer, and, and the engineers have solved that. Those are the only two problems that we've had. And um, the loss of the wind sensor means it's very difficult to um, uh, get good wind readings uh, in terms of direction. Uh, but it's nothing else at all has gone wrong, which is really fantastic. Yeah. So. Um, there, there are two models for the formation of the strata in Mount Sharp. 
both of which are ridiculous. Um, <laughs> one, one of them is that you have this giant crater. Let me, let me go back to an image. Um, all the way back to the end, is you basically have this giant crater with a mountain in the middle. The top of this mountain is, uh, I think it's almost 500 meters higher than the crater rim. And so one model is that this was a giant lake and it all filled up over the rim, overflowing, and then wind blew out all of this sediment and left the mountain behind. Um, there's no outflow, so it can't have been fluvial erosion. Um, that's a huge volume of sediment to remove by wind. The other model is that the entire mountain was created by wind, uh, many kilometers high. You had catabatic winds blowing in, and a lull in the middle where sediment accumulated, maybe helped with some uh, water moisture, and you pile this whole thing up, which doesn't make sense either. And, and so we're going to be looking at the rocks in this lower part here. When you look at the rocks up here, there's some things that look like they are aeolian dune forms. Um, and there's giant canyons, and there's all sorts of stuff. And, that, and basically, it requires a lot of different processes, I think, to form these, these different textures. Um, and when I was asked to comment on the model for the wind forming Mount Sharp, I said it wasn't convincing. Um, the thing is, when we, when we actually start looking at these sediments, we'll have a much, much better idea. There's no, there's no equivalent on Earth. There's no facies model. Uh, for this, and so it's, it's really, really exciting to be able to, to uh, start uh, by looking at this. So then you, you, know, you sort of ask, well, what do you do? How do you start? Um, I've done enough sequence stratigraphy um, that you know, some of us have mapped out some of these layers, and um, what I'm actually going to take the next year off uh, on sabbatical. And, and one of my goals is to really combine these orbital images with the images from Curiosity and, and really see, first of all, how many of these layers can we trace laterally? How horizontal are they? Can we see anything that fits within a model of sequence stratigraphy that it won't be the same? It's not controlled by sea level. Um, but what are those straddle geometries? And then we're only going to be able to go up one small area, and hopefully we can use the regional data to direct uh, that work the way a, a geologist does on Earth. So the question was, when you're doing something so revolutionary, how do you uh, balance generating data and generalizing? Um, it, it actually even gets worse than that, because every single weekday we have to make and check a plan to send to the rover to decide what to do. So we call that ta tactical operations. And it really literally takes about 100 people every single day to ask the rover to do things. And then you sort of have to decide what the rover's going to do on a several day time scale, a week time scale, the six months it takes us to get to Mount Sharp, how many times are we going to stop. You have to interpret the data you're getting back to make those decisions on that short-term basis, but then you also have to take the time to measure the rounding on every single grain you can see in the image to do the statistics to show that you have long-term water flow. And that balance is very, very difficult, and different people in the mission take different parts of it. And, um, and then when you add your regular life in on top of that, it, it, becomes, it becomes very difficult, which is why I'm going to take a break from the, my regular life. I did for four months, and then I, I went back to teaching some, and I decided that I just can't do it because I really want to do this work on the lower slopes of Mount Sharp and write up what I've done. And so every day we have science discussions, or most days, and those are the times where we go from the details to the more generalization, and then um, we basically are picking people to write the papers that are getting published, the first set of those, and then people are volunteering. And I'm supposed to write one which I haven't been working on, and I'll, I won't get till, to till July.
but but it's 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 very it's a very interesting thing. It's, it's very very exciting, and different people find different places in that to, to do it. So the the central peaks, asteroids, and impacts often can create central peaks. Everyone I've talked to says they don't make them that are higher than the crater rim, and so that's that's a real that's a real problem. I mean, you can certainly most of the models, for example, the model where wind does it has uses the central peak to localize the deposition uh, early on. Um, I, I taught a graduate class this last quarter looking at a lot of this uh, stratigraphy, and that top peak has boulders weathering out of it. It's hard rock. And it would be so nice if you could just have it be a result of the impact and, and have a peak that's higher than the crater rim. But people say that that doesn't happen. And, and the modeling doesn't get it, and we don't see other craters with that, that actually happening. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's something I still keep in my mind, though. Oh. <laughs> um, I don't know about qualified, but um, uh, Inspiration Mars has an, a web page that they opened up, and uh, I think about a month ago, for volunteers. And last I heard, they have 80,000. <laughs> I don't know. I presume that some of those would be qualified, depending on how you define that. I am not one of those volunteers. I like field work with real rocks that I can touch, not through gloves. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Well, at this time, I'd like to uh, ask you to give Donna a great round of applause.